Welcome to the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brian Wood, our medical director, to introduce our guest. Welcome everyone on this World AIDS Day. Happy to see all of you. We have a packed, exciting session and I think without further ado, I'll just turn it over to Hillary who's going to talk about trichomonasin HIV. Thank you for having me here today and I'm going to talk to us today about trichomonas and have some emphasis about trichomonas and HIV. I think after I spoke so enthusiastically the other week about one of the cases, Brian decided that he should give me 15 minutes to just go on and on. So here is a picture that I love of an epithelial cell, a vaginal epithelial cell being absolutely swarmed by trichomonads. You can see their flagelli. It's really pretty impressive. So we're going to start with just thinking about a case. And I've titled it Trichomonas, sometimes tricky to find. This is a 45-year-old African-American woman with HIV whose last CD4 count was 642 with a suppressed viral load. She presents to you with vaginal itching, malodorous vaginal discharge, and mild dysuria. She denies abdominal pain and says she has not been sexually active for several years. Her pelvic exam is significant for yellow-green frothy discharge, a pH greater than 5, positive whiff test, and no cervical motion tenderness. Wet mount reveals copious white blood cells greater than five for high power field, no clue cells, no trichomonads, and the KOH prep is negative for fungal elements. So the question I want you guys to think about is could she have trichomoniasis and how can we find out? I think this is a really common scenario where we look under the microscope and depending on the quality of your microscope or your microscopist, it can be sometimes hard to see trichomonas. So this is the typical discharge we see. We like food analogies in medicine. I say BV is the skim milk, sort of thin, gray, homogenous, adherent discharge. Candida is the cottage cheese discharge. And I say this is sort of the milkshake discharge. Frothy, yellowish, malodorous. And this is a picture of what you might see on the cervix of someone with trichomonas. We call this strawberry cervix, or the fancy word is colpitis macularis. And the picture on the top left is really what is the classic presentation of strawberry cervix. It looks truly like a strawberry. You get these small areas of hemorrhagic erosion with some central pallor. But I think what we see more commonly is on the bottom right, which is these small petechiae all over the cervix. And this is usually associated with a higher burden of trichomonal disease. This is a saline microscopy of trichomonas vaginalis with copious PMNs in the background. The arrow is pointing to a trichomonad. Often, it's very hard to see the difference between a trichomonad, an epithelial cell, a white blood cell, and a lot of times your only clue is just a little bit of vibration behind the trichomonad where the flagella is, is vibrating in the water, in the saline. So trichomoniasis has been called the neglected STD in a recent paper written by um, Dr. Mitas at the CDC. Trichomonas is really underappreciated in its importance. It's the most prevalent non-viral STD in the U.S. and we think in the world as well. There's somewhere between 3.7 and 8 million new cases per year estimated in the United States. It's not reportable and there's a wider age distribution of 20 to 45 years which in the STD world is really kind of the elderly population, I hate to say, as I am older than that age now. The prevalence is about 3% in the U.S. general population, and as high as 20% in U.S. black women. Like many other STDs, there's really racial disparities in trichomonas, and I would just tell you that even though it's not reportable, I would direct all of you to the recent CDC STD surveillance report from 2015, which really dwells on and emphasizes the racial disparities in STDs. There are very high rates in incarcerated women, and in, one stud in some studies, 9 to 32 percent of incarcerated women and 2 to 9 percent of men who are screened. It's very rare in men who have sex with men. We do not think the throat or the rectum are good reservoirs. And there have been some studies that found some trichomonads in 5 percent of men who have sex with men in the rectum, but it's thought that that might be associated with recent deposition rather than its tr true infection. Most people with trichomonas are asymptomatic and it may persist for years. It does not mean when you see trichomonads on testing, it does not mean that someone has had recent acquisition. It can lead to a lot of complications including preterm delivery, low birth weight, and PID. And there are major implications worldwide. Multiple studies show increased acquisition and transmission of HIV if there's 
trick infection, up to two to three times the increased acquisition. So seeing trick on a wet mount is really a coin flip. The wet mount is thought to be kind of 51 to 65% sensitive compared to culture. And so here's the sensitivity and specificity of a wet mount, really terrible. And so when you see it, it's exciting. But when you don't see it, it does not mean someone doesn't have trichomonas. Also, I think this is a brilliant study. Several people have looked at the shelf life of wet mounts for trichomonas and put the wet mounts under the microscope and come back, have come back in different time intervals. In this study, they came back at 10 minutes, 30 minutes, and 120 minutes to see how many trick survived. And you can see after 10 minutes, 20% of the trick had died. So that it, it's really important to do your testing quickly if you're relying only on wet mounts. In the other study by Dr. Stoner, they also saw at one hour there's 20% decreased motility of trichomonads. And one thing that they found that I think is really practical for us is that if you know you're going to have to wait a little bit of time before you do your microscopy, it's better to actually put your sample in a test tube with some saline instead of preparing the slide because the trick die much more quickly once prepared on the slide. There are new testing options, thankfully. There's a rapid antigen test that's called the OSUM test, and it's significantly better than wet mount. As you can see from the picture on the top right, this really looks like a rapid strep antigen test that you might do in your clinic. It's an immunochromatographic capillary dipstick flow technology test. I practiced that a couple of times. And the sensitivity is about 83%. In this study, they actually had pretty high sensitivity with wet prep, which was 71%. Some studies have shown slightly higher sensitivity as well. This is nice if you want to have a point of care test right in your clinic with results available in 10 minutes, but it's not perfect. There is also a, a NAT test that is made by Aptima, and this was FDA approved in 2011. And it utilizes the same technology and platform as the Aptima Combo 2, which most of us use for gonorrhea and chlamydia. And you can use the same specimen type, vaginal swab, endocervical swab, or urine in women. It's actually only FDA approved for women, but like testing for extragenital sites in men, it can be used with urethral swabs or urine in men if it's CLIA validated by your lab. And I'll show you a little data about the NAT test. They looked at this in 933 women, and in this study there, were 12, there was 12% prevalence of trichomonas. They compared the NAT to the previous gold standards, which was wet mount plus culture, which as we know isn't great, but that's what they use as the reference. So there were no differences in performance for symptomatic versus asymptomatic women. And you can see the sensitivity is really very high, it's slightly lower using urine than vaginal swab or endocervical swab or thin prep. And the specificity actually ends up looking a little bit lower because it's being compared to such imperfect tests, but very, very high sensitivity. And I think we have started using this in the Madison Clinic, and since we have, we have definitely picked up a lot more trichomoniasis than we had seen before. I'll just say one little note about thin prep or using pap smear to detect trichomonas. This is an area of some controversy, and in studies there have been false positives and false negatives associated with pap smear positivity for trick. It is not a test that I would use by itself to depend on finding trick. So don't think your pap smear is going to be what's going to pick up trick. You can use your pap smear to do NAT testing, that's different. But if you do see trick on a pap smear, Especially in a high-risk population, I would assume that means they have trichomonas and I would, I would treat for trichomonas. But it is an area of controversy and the CDC says you can't depend only on the pap smear for making your diagnosis. So what do we do for treatment? In the CDC 2015 guidelines, they recommend two grams of metronidazone a single dose, which in studies has shown an 84 to 98% cure, or you can use tinidazole, which is another nitroamidazole, two grams PO in a single dose, and has essentially the same cure rates. Tinidazole, I don't know if people have used it, is a relative of metronidazole. It, ha it is more expensive, it has higher tissue penetration and better side effect profile with a lot less nausea and vomiting. It does have a longer half-life, so because you can get disulfiram effects from metronidazole and tinidazole, 
With metronidazole, you have to not drink for about 24 to 48 hours after you finish therapy. With tinidazole, you should wait 72 hours, so that can be a problem in some patients. The alternative regimen is the seven-day course of metronidazole, which is what we use for BV. Metronidazole is considered safe at all stages of pregnancy. Tinidazole is not. It's category C and not recommended in pregnancy. It really hasn't been studied very much in that population. Vaginal therapy or topical metronidazole gel is ineffective, and we think that's because trichomonas really can lurk into the deep glands around the vagina, and it does not penetrate those reservoirs. You should treat sex partners, male and female, and test for other STDs, including HIV, when you find trichomonas. So what about trichomonas and HIV? Well, in one study, up to 53% of women with HIV were also infect infected with trichomonas. This is, I think, a, quite a high-risk sample. These were urban women, all African-American, who were currently using drugs, but many studies show up to 30% rates of trichomonas in women with HIV. We know that TRIC increases genital shedding of HIV significantly, and this is associated with an increased risk of preterm birth, high rates of PID in women with trichomonas, and vertical HIV transmission. Thankfully, treatment of trichomonas does decrease HIV genital shedding, and that has been studied. What is currently recommended is routine screening of HIV-infected women at entry to care, then annually if sexually active, and at their first prenatal visit if pregnant, and then all women with HIV, and probably all women with TRIC in general, should be rescreened three months after therapy. Treatment of TRIC in HIV is actually very interesting. Dr. Kissinger in, I believe she's in Atlanta, she did a randomized control trial of 200, New Orleans, sorry, of 270 women who are HIV and trichomonas infected. Their mean age was 40, and 92% were African American. The treatment arms were similar in terms of age, race, CD4 count, viral load, antiretroviral use, the site, this was a multi-site study, and loss to follow-up. There was actually very little loss to follow-up in this study. Women were either treated with two grams of metronidazole versus a seven-day course of metronidazole twice a day, and they were tested at six to 12 days after treatment completed and at three months with a culture. And what I really want to focus on is the results at the test of cure and three months in the seven-day dosing and the single dosing. And so at six to 12 days, which they considered their test of cure, 8% of women who got the seven-day dose had ongoing infection, while 16% who had single dose. And this was statistically significant. And then at three months, 11% of the women who had the seven-day course had trichomonas compared to 24% who had received the single dose. Because of this, the treatment guidelines recommend that metronidazole 2 grams PO as a single dose is not as effective as the seven-day course. One thing that was very interesting in secondary analysis is that they found that about 67% of the women in this study had BV as well. So it may be that because their BV wasn't properly treated, we know that two grams is not enough to treat BV, is that this may have contributed to the fact that they also could not clear their trichomonas. So that's an area of study. Recurrent infection is very common with trichomonas, up to 17% at three months. And reinfection is really the most important element here. Non-compliance with metronidazole therapy is less relevant with single-dose observed therapy. There is evidence of infection with metronidazole-resistant strains, probably in 4 to 10 percent of women with trichomonas. Tinidazole resistance is about 1 percent of these women. It is recommended that you rescreen women at three months, no less than two weeks, because especially if you're using NAT testing, because you may have false positives or false negatives due to killed organisms. It's really unclear in men what to do for follow-up. You should ensure partner treatment and avoid sex until all are cured. And consider expedited partner therapy, although the studies haven't been very clear about its efficacy. It, the CDC still recommends considering it. Finally, additional issues in the 2015 guidelines. I think I already talked about the follow-up issues. Allergy or intolerance to the regimen. Consider metronidazole desensitization, and we can send you some information about protocols for that. Peromomycin cream is not very effective, and it may cause ulcers, so it's not a great option, but that is what is recommended for allergy or 
intolerance to the regimen. In terms of pregnancy, it is a little bit complicated, but again, we talked about that metronidazole is considered safe, and breastfeeding should probably be deferred during metronidazole treatment and not done during tenidazole. If someone has persistent or recurrent trick, again, this is probably due to reinfection, so you really want to assure partner treatment. Then consider higher dose metronidazole, the seven day course of metronidazole, then a higher dose metronidazole or tenidazole, seven day course, and then you can consider very high dose tenidazole for two weeks with topical tenidazole that has to be compounded. And this is a time to consider involving a specialist. There are other options. And then if you really are convinced that this person has not been reinfected and this could be resistance, you can call the CDC at this number and someone will pick up in the Trichomonas lab at the CDC and they will talk to you and they will send you collection kits so that you can collect a sample, send it to the CDC and they will do susceptibility testing for you and provide consultation. And I know a lot of people who have done that and found it very helpful and interesting. So, my final slide here is key points about trichomonas. It's very common and often found in an older population than other STDs. Consider NAT testing if saline microscopy is unrevealing. Screen for trichomonas in women with HIV at entry to care and annually thereafter. Again, remember that women with HIV should be treated with a seven-day course rather than single-dose therapy. Consider expedited partner therapy and follow-up testing in three months. And reinfection is the most common cause of ongoing infection, but there is emerging resistance, and contact the CDC if you suspect that.